Uh, so good morning, everyone, for for the second day of the school. Uh, before we start uh, today's first lecture, I will make uh, some quick announcements. So in the evening, we'll go for a conference dinner. Uh, you all uh, must have got the address of the uh, this Heidegger. Uh, but anyway, we'll leave the institute together at five o'clock. Uh, but if you want to go there uh, on your own, then yeah, you know the address uh, and you can be there uh, by public transport or taxi. Uh, important thing is uh, there they may check uh, your vaccine certificates or tests. So please uh, uh, keep it ready on your phone or with you so that you can show it easily. And if you need to get tested, then do it before because the antigen tests uh, are valid only for 24 hours now. So yeah and keep some warm clothes with you because uh, it may get colder at night so yeah okay all right <clears throat> welcome everybody it's a pleasure now to continue with next lecture on uh, spin qubits in diamond and uh, today we are going to touch another application area related to uh, sensing uh, and metrology and uh, just as a starting slide, I show you here one of the rare cases where we use natural diamonds. We have discussed yesterday a lot of experiments with uh, NV centers and uh, in the beginning of this research work, uh, synthetic diamonds were not clean enough, sort of. So we were often using the natural crystals, the best one. Um, and we stopped to do this um, and now use uh, isotopically engineered uh, synthetic materials. But for our color centers that we cannot do ourselves yet in the lab, we are still sometimes using these uh, very nice crystals. And uh, so here you see one example. It's a crystal that we borrowed from a company selling gems. And uh, this uh, natural diamond do have some very rare color centers, which we think might be interesting in future uh, for quantum technology, provided that we can uh, create them artificially. So any technological application require ability to engineer defects, for example, by ion implantation, as uh, we have discussed uh, yesterday. Now, uh, applications area, we have uh, discussed quantum information processing, how to create small scale and large scale quantum computers based on electron and nuclear spins, and then couplet electron spins or electron spins couplet uh, by photons in such uh, uh, resonators. And during next two lectures, we are going to talk about uh, making magnetometers out of uh, NV centers and making temperature sensors. Uh, and finally, improving microscopic devices like, for example, magnetic resonance tomographs and also devices for uh, navigation using uh, color centers in diamond. So I will start with motivating this uh, magnetometry work. And uh, uh, the main motivation here was uh, to make new tools for life sciences, especially because uh, qubits in diamond can operate under ambient condition. You can bring them in touch with uh, some other environment, biologically relevant, and this is very uh, important application area. Actually, uh, I'm going to highlight a few applications, but there are more of them. And here is the outline of the lecture. Uh, we will start with uh, uh, some fundamentals uh, in uh, sensing and metrology. What are the limits in precision in measuring amplitude and frequency of the uh, magnetic fields? Then I'm going to talk about nanoscale nuclear magnetic resonance application where you use uh, NV center to sense a nanoscale volume uh, filled with nuclear spins. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, industrial applications, first prototypes of uh, NV center magnetometers. And then I'm going to highlight a little bit the experiments in, uh, in cells. So this will be topic of this lecture. And during next lecture, we are going to discuss MRI and MRT. Yeah, so uh, actually application of uh, qubits for uh, life sciences is a success story, uh, but it also has a history. Physics always uh, delivered uh, new tools for life sciences and medicine. I give you 
a few examples. Uh, invention of optical microscopy allowed us to see inside the cell. Electron microscopy allowed us to understand the structure of biomolecules and magnetic resonance imaging nowadays uh, is a, a, one of the major tools in, uh, in medical uh, treatment. And uh, it is uh, also possible that quantum science will be another building block in this uh, success story. Uh, where we think uh, quantum uh, physics can be applied. Actually, if you ask uh, a person working in the field of biophysics or biochemistry or biology, and you ask what could be the dream microscope for him. And so he will maybe tell you that it should be a microscope that can see single molecule and resolve individual atoms with chemical resolution so that you can distinguish different atoms or maybe even atoms in a different environment, uh, allowing you to reconstruct the three-dimensional picture of this molecule and not only being static, but also uh, resolve the dynamic of the molecule. So having a resolution on the order of microsecond to see conformational changes uh, because the structure defined a function. And uh, this is not all. So this uh, microscope should also be able to operate in kind of cells uh, or living environment. And so that's very difficult to do at the moment. Electron microscope can see molecules, but in vacuum, uh, you sometimes need to freeze everything. Uh, and such a microscope would be a game changer uh, in the field. And even a small improvement going to this goal uh, with a small step can already provide a very high reward in a way. So actually, uh, biology and medicine is a case where a 10% improvement make you a breakthrough. So it's not like a quantum computer where you need to make your computer a thousand times faster, otherwise it's not worse. But think about biological imaging. If you make it 10 times 10% 10 sharper, so it's allow you to see more, and this is already very important. So here, quantum advantage, if you want, is uh, very, very close. You need to be just a little bit better to, uh, to have an important result. There are techniques, of course, actually developed in this direction, and I highlight two of them that are coming pretty close to high sensitivity and uh, chemical uh, resolution. One is uh, optical microscopy, single molecule microscopy. Uh, nowadays, you can label uh, biomolecules with fluorescent proteins like GFP and then resolve them uh, in, a, in a microscope. Here is an example of the picture. Uh, cells label it with different fluorescent proteins and with uh, sensitivity that uh, confocal microscopy allows, you can get to single molecule level. Actually, detection of Invisente is somehow technically similar to this technique of detecting a single molecule. But uh, the only difference to this uh, big goal is that you always just image the label. You don't image the molecule itself and not atoms inside of molecule. So that's allow you to visualize where molecules are, but not allow you to see uh, much more about the uh, chemical composition. And with some reservation, uh, uh, you cannot really resolve the structure in a real time. Another technique that is very different is uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. That's not a microscope. It's rather a spectrometer where you detect a spectrum associated with magnetic signals coming from the molecule. Uh, if you put molecule in a magnetic field, there is a Lamar precession of spins. And each individual spin, owing to its environment, precess with a bit different frequency, making pretty complex spectrum. If you can resolve the spectrum and you understand the interaction leading to the splittings, uh, you can reconstruct the three-dimensional uh, structure of the molecule you are looking. So this is very powerful technique and a lot of uh, biomolecules, proteins, were uh, actually unraveled uh, using uh, this uh, technology. Also MRI is another side of it. We are going to talk about it a bit later but there are some limitations. And so today we are going to talk uh, as a main motivation about overcoming limitations of nuclear magnetic resonance uh, using uh, color centers in diamond. <clears throat> so the limitation and sensitivity comes from two sides. 
One is a low polarization of nuclear spins uh, under ambient condition. Even in high fields uh, at 300 Kelvin, you have roughly equal population of uh, different spin sublevels, and this leads to a very low thermal overshoot of spin you are going to use for detection over a kind of unpolarized bus. So only a very tiny fraction of molecules or spins contribute to the signal. This fraction is on the order of 10 to the minus 6. Only one nuclear spin out of million contribute to the signal. That's very large loss of uh, signal leading to low sensitivity of the technique. Uh, another uh, limitation is related to the way how we detect the signal. In a conventional NMR spectrometer, the signal is detected by induction coil. So you detect a flux change through the coil, and this is pretty noisy. And this noise in the coil also limits the number of nuclear spin you can detect. Typically, you can measure 10 to the 12 spins, but in order to uh, reach this number of polarized spins, you need about 10 to the 18 uh, <coughs> spins in a volume. So this is, you know, an order of a micromolar, and this is a limit of limitation of conventional nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, today we are going to talk about two sides of improvement here. So we are going to first discuss about improving detection uh, using NV center magnetometer, and in a second lecture. I'm going to uh, highlight recent results on hyperpolarizing samples. Uh, using uh, spin qubits in diamond. And these two sides naturally contribute uh, to improvement uh, of the sensitivity. So how we can uh, measure nuclear spins with NV centers. So essentially uh, bringing NV center uh, and using it as a very small magnetometer uh, to the molecule of interest. And if you come very close, even a single nuclear spin create a non-negligible field. And coming back to the yesterday lecture, some example of this kind of experiments where you're close to the nuclear spins you have seen in context of quantum processor in diamond. Now you turn this ability to detect uh, nuclear spins in a field of sensing of unknown uh, nuclear spins and so this is a different site, uh, different application, but it's a similar technology. So we would like to interface uh, diamond having a very sensitive uh, qubits with long coherence time with sample containing nuclear spins. The sample may be associated with biomolecules. We want to measure a spectrum of NMR of this molecule. So this is idea behind this experiment. So we use uh, NV center as a sensor. I don't need to repeat so much, but the ground state of this defect is spin triplet and spin triplet uh, is sensitive to magnetic field. So this term in Hamiltonian allow you to actually reconstruct the magnetic field in a static and in a dynamic way. In quantum computer, you would like to shield your qubit from any fields. You would like to keep your coherence time as long as possible. In a sensing scenario, you would like to shield your qubit from the noise, but be open for the signal. So it's a bit different here. And so we are going to discuss now a different modality of uh, this experiment. So we use the same setup as before. Uh, having NB centers implanted, we check that uh, they are single, but now we try always to get NB centers very close to the surface differently to uh, the case of quantum computer. And measurement of magnetic field uh, is, uh, it can be understood in a very simple picture. So if you apply magnetic field, the triplet energy levels start to shift. And uh, uh, by measuring the frequency of transitions or knowing the uh, G factor of your system, uh, you can reconstruct the uh, amplitude of the magnetic field. You also, can uh, reconstruct the vector of magnetic field for NV center. And this is very particular feature because NV center owing to its triplet state have some internal symmetry X. And so you can get the absolute uh, value of the amplitude, but you can also get the uh, direction uh, of the magnetic field. 
how precisely you can do it well um, intuitively i would say the sharper the spectral line the better i can track it in other words so the longer is coherence time the better i can measure uh, the field and the best way to do it for dc field is not really tracking the spectral line although in many experiments it, it's exactly this way how it is done uh, but it's excite uh, coherence as a proposition and now your spin start to process as we have seen yesterday for the case of measuring t2 time and this precession uh, is uh, keeping the information about detuning between uh, spin frequency and your microwave frequency so measuring this precession leaving the spin to acquire the phase and then measure this phase is actually the measurement uh, of the magnetic field so the phase is proportional to atomic parameters and then uh, the magnetic field and time you acquire. Uh, usually, if you work with very small number of spin or single NV center, you need to repeat measurement because uh, after one measurement, NV center can be either in state zero and one is very noisy, it's even random in some cases. And in order to get signal that carry information, you usually repeat many times. And uh, then, of course, the signal improves, the noise decreases, uh, you get better sensitivity. And how this scales with the number of measurements? Well, uh, the smallest possible field, and this is a field uh, that uh, you can measure in case if the field is equivalent to your noise, is uh, scaling as, again, atomic parameters, but then there's a uh, number of atoms, uh, coherence time, F, and total number of measurements. So it scales with the square root of number of repetitions, square root of time. Uh, if you want to improve your precision by a factor of two, you have to measure four times longer. And uh, on the other hand, you see that there is a coherence time here in a denominator. So the longer you can acquire the phase, uh, the better your precision is for the amplitude of the unknown field. And so that's why having a qubit with a long coherence time, it's very important uh, for the magnetometry experiment because long coherence time is the only resource that you have to improve the sensitivity. Another resource is the number of atoms, but once your sensor have many atoms, it gets large and you cannot bring it so close to the nuclear spin in the scenario I was talking before. So if you want to keep your sensor to be very small, it will be one atom. And in this case, the only resource that you have to improve the sensitivity is to make your uh, sensor to have longer coherence time. And candidate for good sensors are always good uh, qubits with good coherence time. Right, uh, so what about coherence time of NV center? For the best one, in Ramsey fringes, we have about 500 microseconds in isotopical engineered diamond. Uh, it's uh, not always the case, this long coherence time for very shallow NV centers, but even for those, you have a few microseconds. And this translates to certain sensitivity and volume. And this product of volume, multiplied by sensitivity is important benchmark for atomic magnetometers and magnetometers in general. So here is a picture uh, from a, a recent paper by Morgan Mitchell, where he basically uh, summarized performance at very different sensors. Uh, on Y-X, we have uh, sensitivity in a fraction of the Tesla, and on X axis is a dimension uh, or size of your magnetometer. And uh, there are different technologies here. Actually, atomic magnetometers can be extremely sensitive in a femtotesla uh, scale, but they are usually quite large. And when they get smaller, the sensitivity drops. Uh, squids, superconducting interference uh, devices based technologies also have very high sensitivity, but you need to cool them. And that's mean that they are getting larger uh, because it's the size of the whole device usually you need to consider. 
And in these centers in diamond are somewhere in this range, especially the single one. So they're very small, less than 10 nanometers. So you can place them very close. They are actually even smaller than 10 nanometers, so even smaller than one nanometer. But here what matter is ability to, to get in touch with some other material. And so the standoff distance in this case is the depth of the NV center. So they're about uh, 10 to three nanometers. They may be not super sensitive in this scenario, but the product, the volume to, and the sensitivity is actually unbeatable. So they're the best in terms of the standoff distance. So the ideal sensor would be somewhere here and down here, but uh, so that's what we have at the moment. And uh, we're going to discuss now experiments with a single color centers in different sensing scenarios, especially in detecting nuclear spins. Detecting nuclear spins mean detecting spectrum. It's not about detecting just the field. And so you need to think about how to realize a spectrum analyzer, not just a magnetometer. And so one of the way to do it is to apply many of echo pulses we have discussed yesterday. Echo actually provides you kind of a, a barrier to external noise, except certain frequency. So this frequency can be detected as a phase accumulation and uh, so this most simple way to construct spectrum analyzer uh, using NV center is to apply many, many pi pulses after pi half. And that's create a modulation and a sensitivity. You refocus all the fields except one that are locked uh, in the phase and frequency with uh, uh, basically uh, timing of these pulses. It's a bit similar to uh, optical grating and optical spectrometer. If you want to detect a certain component in optical spectrum, you put a grating and in a certain direction, you get a phase matching of diffracted beams. And so you can select now different colors. And here you also can select different colors by selecting now not the angle on a grating, but selecting the time between pulses. So that's allow you to make a spectrometer uh, out of uh, your qubit. And so then you can make your sensitivity function design. You can make your sensitivity function sharper if you put more pulses and you can tune the frequency if you make a timing between pulses shorter. We are going to uh, get a bit more uh, details about this uh, technique later. Um, NMR nanoscale is also a bit different from NMR in a conventional spectrometer. You work with very small number of spins. And if the spin number is very small, actually you come to an interesting regime. Uh, for uh, a few spins, uh, you don't need to polarize them in order to get the signal. For a few spins, there is always an uh, imbalance between spin up and spin down. There is a kind of a noise on the polarization that you can use in your favor. Uh, for example, in a three spin ensemble, there will be always one overshoot. You can have two spin up, one down, or other way around, or all three spin up, this all fluctuates. But in every single moment, there is always imbalance. And this imbalance can be much larger than the best uh, thermal polarization. So for, if you have a very small number of spins, there is always a square root of n, which is overshoot of one spin over another. And that can be used actually to detect significant signal. For a single spin, there will be always 100% stochastic polarization because single spin can be either in spin up or in spin down. As we have seen in the picture of quantum jumps, the spin was not polarized, but in every single moment, we have seen this pointing up or spin the pointing down. So it was polarized in every single moment. So it's kind of interesting feature, which can be uh, interesting for uh, detecting quite a significant signals without doing too much effort just hearing external spins and they will provide a signal and so we apply uh, echo pulses uh, to tune our uh, sensitivity function to the resonance and this is one of the spectrum we have recorded some time ago we had just oil uh, this viscous oil on top of diamond and and v center was about two nanometers below the surface and we have tuned the uh, sensitivity functions through the LARMA precession frequency of nuclear spins. Here you see the signal. It's coming from a null magnetic field to some resonance uh, uh, value, and then again to no magnetic fields. And the peak 
of this magnetic field here is on the order of two microtesla. So two microtesla, it's not very large field, but it's not uh, uh, also not a femtotesla. Yeah? So, so two microtesla is quite actually a significant field. It's on the order of what even whole sensors uh, can detect. Uh, but important here that this signal decays very quickly because the distance from nuclear spins to your sensor. So it's uh, to get this very high fields, you need to get very close. And that's why in V center is very uh, interesting uh, uh, sensor here because you can bring it very close to this uh, external spins. Then you get very high polarization, stochastic polarization, and you also get a significant signal even from a single nuclear spin. So in this case, it was about 100 nuclear spins detected providing uh, this uh, signal. So you can detect it on a reasonable time scale. These experiments uh, took a few minutes to get a uh, reasonable signal to noise ratio. And uh, in terms of sensitivity, it's very large difference to conventional NMR. So you need a centimeter size samples. And so here you have a sample that is just a few nanometer size, so orders of magnitude. But there are also some drawbacks. It's not only pluses you get from this. Uh, uh, from this spectra. For example, you can uh, immediately see that the line width here is not negligible, and we will discuss these points later. Uh, nevertheless, this tool uh, is already uh, well developed enough to detect interesting molecules. And in the model experiment, the uh, uh, looking team was able uh, to detect individual proteins. Uh, on the surface of diamond, individual protein molecules. Conventional NMR, remember, require micromolar of molecules. And in this case, in vCenter was placed uh, very close to diamond surface and then proteins were touched. Those were proteins with a known structure to just make sure that you detect what you uh, want to detect. It's a ubiquitin, very stable protein, small protein, uh, play an important role in regulatory, regulatory function uh, in the cells. And in this case, there was a chemical link between diamond and the uh, protein. And so in V center was measuring larmor precession of spins inside of protein. So this link is also important, uh, actually, too, uh, how to connect biomolecule with a sensor. Uh, so it's done via carboxy groups. Uh, you start with amino group and then uh, make a carboxy, and this is uh, a link, and then you attach a protein. And this is IFM picture of the surface of diamond before attachment of protein. So it's very flat. Uh, after you uh, make a chemical link and you put a solution of proteins and you leave them to attach, and then you wash all the proteins that are not attached, you get this rough uh, uh, picture of the surface. And uh, that's mean that you have now close to monolayer of this protein. And behind one of them, there is an NV center, and this NV center sends only one molecule because the others uh, are producing too low signal to be detectable. So in, in a sense, it's a sensor that selects now a single molecule. And you can now do these tricks with uh, scanning a filter function through and detecting an MR spectra now, not of the oil, but of the protein, and just to make sure that uh, the protein was a source of the signal, it was labeled with rare isotopes, with deuterium and uh, carbon-13, and you can detect spectra of both deuterium and carbon-13 uh, now inside of protein, and diamond itself was not having carbon-13 in this case. So it was depleted with carbon-13, and so the signal was coming from uh, the nuclear spins in a single uh, biomolecule. Right, so that's very exciting. And what would be the next steps? So next steps would be to unravel the structure of unknown molecule. And this was our big goal. We declared it in the beginning of this lecture. And in order to do this, you need to be able to acquire such a complex spectra being well resolved. Uh, and remember, the line waves I was showing you before was in the order of 100 kilohertz. And the whole picture here, if you put it in a frequency domain, uh, the whole uh, scale is maybe a one kilohertz, and there are hundreds of lines. And so you need to do much better in terms of uh, spectral resolution. 
And if you want to detect dynamics, uh, you should be able to actually reach to uh, a regime where your sensitivity allow you snapshots on a millisecond time scale, not on a minute. So actually two parameters, sensitivity and spectral resolution uh, is, um, is very important uh, to improve. I'm going to talk about both of them. And it turns out that this first point to get better spectral resolution is maybe the first uh, goal to reach. Uh, improving sensitivity might be a bit more challenging because as we discussed before, sensitivity improvement is about improving coherence time of the qubits. There is no other ways to do it. Right, uh, but maybe... Uh, a few words about the uh, uh, next steps that were done using conventional techniques and making a chemical structure uh, resolvable is possible going to high magnetic fields where different nuclei in different chemical environments start to be resolved. So the shift associated with chemical environment is called in NMR chemical shift. And in very high fields, this chemical shift can reach a few tens of kilohertz. Uh, and uh, this is basically experiment that was done by your Prachtrup group recently, where he was able to resolve a chemical shift of a few molecule uh, having a fluor in the structure, but these fluor groups were in a different environment. This one was having a different chemical uh, environment, uh, shielding of the external magnetic field by electron spins from this group of fluor nuclear spin, and they appear uh, to be separate uh, in this NMR spectra. And this experiment was done in the high field in order to separate the spectral lines uh, in, in a good enough manner that you can detect it using NV center. So resolving chemical structure actually is possible even using current techniques, but uh, in really high, uh, really high field. Um, going beyond this require resolving uh, J coupling and nuclear overhauser effect. J coupling is a coupling of nuclear spins, not directly via dipole dipole coupling, but via electrons. And those are usually tiny shifts. And uh, nuclear overhauser effect is more dipole dipole interaction. It's via distance, not via chemical bonds. And these two elements are very essential for uh, molecular structure reconstruction. Uh, and resolving this require higher spectral resolution. So we cannot do it with a kilohertz, uh, uh, basically uh, filter functions. And uh, that's uh, the topic now of our uh, uh, next uh, part of the lecture. Uh, in order to um, introduce the limits in spectral resolution, not in sensitivity, I would like to uh, give you a little bit more details about this echoes and how they allow you to acquire the signal. Uh, so if we start again with the Ramsey experiments, you are very familiar now with this. So you excite your qubit in a superposition of zero and one, and then you acquire the phase. And so you measure this phase after the second pi half pulse. This phase is related to the magnetic field that is uh, applied to your qubit. Now, if you have some noise and the energy levels start to shake, of course, that reduces your ability now to measure the, uh, the phase. And your sensitivity and spectral resolution are both limited by T2 star. You can apply echoes and you uh, refocus unwanted noise. So the static components of a magnetic field are refocused and you only acquire dynamics components. Uh, the sensitivity is now limited by T2, not T2 star, how we have defined this uh, sensitivity during the uh, last lecture. Uh, you can do more complex echoes. You have seen one example with this many, many pi pulses following one after another. That's required to make a sharper filtering function, but also cancel more and more noise because you are not leaving uh, your qubits to be successible to uh, external fields, except one particular frequency. And this technique is called uh, dynamical decoupling. Uh, it's a uh, more general words on applying echoes. So it decouple your qubit from external noise. And in this case, uh, you can uh, refocus static, but also part of dynamics component. Uh, and uh, in this case, you get accumulation of phase related only to one particular frequency 
of external perturbation. And this is a frequency you would like to measure, you would like to sense. Uh, and uh, you get some um, basically phase sensitivity on top of this, only for uh, external fields that are uh, acting on your qubit in phase with your pulses, where your external fields start in the right point between pi pulses, this field uh, lead to phase accumulation and some fields that are having right frequencies but are kind of mismatched in a phase, they will not produce observable signals. So you get a um, term that is related to phase of the external field with respect to this uh, phase of following the pulses. So it can be a good point because you are sensitive to phase it can be also a weak point if you like to uh, be sensitive to all uh, waves with all phases but it can be an advantage in reaching high resolution remember before we discussed cases where resolution and sensitivities were limited by coherence time of the sensor now the question is can we do better than this so we have now phase sensitivity of the uh, signal we observe, and for some phases in V center is not sensitive, for some phases it is sensitive. So you can now construct a sequence where you run a few measurements uh, which are phase sensitive. So it's a, a train of echo pulses um, leading to measurements, and here another train of echo pulses leading to measurements of an V. So the this, at this point and at this point, you were phase sensitive to the external field that is acquired uh, by NV center. And uh, observable as a correlation between these two measurements will be phase sensitive. And in this case, because the results of the measurements were kind of uh, stored uh, separately, the sensitivity is uh, limited by uh, T1 time of your in V center. It's important that uh, your in V center survive uh, uh, during this uh, period between two measurements, but the frequency resolution, sorry, not sensitivity, frequency resolution is limited by relaxation time, which can be longer. So that was the first uh, uh, possibility to observe the uh, frequency uh, or basically resolve frequencies better than coherence time of the qubit, which is important uh, aspect in the uh, in the sensing protocols. I can also uh, show you another way to do it, which even uh, is even more powerful in some cases. If you do many phase sensitive measurements one after another, and you do it often, you start to actually uh, acquire the phase of the external uh, signal. And so if you plot the phase, if you record all the measurements without averaging, you start to uh, do kind of a wave uh, form recording of your signal. And if you measure the phase of your local oscillator precise enough, uh, you can get a resolution that is much better than both T1 and T2 time of your qubit. And resolution in this case will be solely limited by uh, accuracy of your local clock. So it's actually a classical clock in many quantum measurements that define their resolution. So you can turn your protocol in a scenario where the resolution is limited, but just the best clock you have in the lab. So you do kind of a locking detection and you detect uh, signals that act on your quantum sensor, but you keep your clock pre more precise then your coherence time of the uh, signal. So you can basically reconstruct now the phase of incoming signal in time, and that's give you the ability to reconstruct the, um, the signal with the precision in frequency resolution and in frequency tracking also uh, better than coherence time of your qubit. And here are examples. Uh, so basically it's a single NV center measurements where you uh, measure resolution uh, in Hertz uh, versus measurement time. These previous protocols usually had quite a limited uh, resolution on the order of a kilohertz because your coherence time of uh, NV center is limited. But if you apply this quantum locking detection technique, how we call it, 
your resolution always improves and reach actually uh, some millihertz uh, until you reach the value of the uh, clock stability that you do have in your laboratory. And you can also resolve uh, signals with much better than hertz resolution. Here we send three control signals separated by 25 and 22 hertz to your NV center. And you can nicely resolve these signals. They are basically uh, resolved with a resolving power solely limited by the uh, by the classical clock that you have in your laboratory. Right. Yes. Yeah, you can have atomic clock, definitely. It's, it's also not uh, impossible. So nowadays you can get atomic clocks. Uh, and uh, yeah, definitely it's possible. But uh, already with a good quartz clock, you reach uh, um, yeah, some millihertz uh, frequency resolution. And usually this is enough. So the, the molecules themselves, they don't have such a nice, uh, uh, you know, emission in, in, in a frequency domain, but it is possible to connect it to any clock you like. Mm. Right. Okay, so this is about uh, frequency uh, resolution. Here we have quite good actually in terms of uh, sensor. So I would say for having a good sensor, you just need to apply these protocols and you get a very good frequency resolution. Um, but uh, the hard task actually is to improve sensitivity. Sensitivity is solely limited by coherence time. And so as we know from quantum computing, having a long coherence time is always a hard task because it's about protecting your system uh, from many effects. Surfaces, especially here in sensing, you need to be close to surface but surface of diamond, you usually don't control 100%. Any interface usually is a big unknown. And uh, so basically controlling the noise from interfaces, from inner defects in a solid is usually a hard task. And quantum computing actually uh, is a field that addressed the uh, question how to improve coherence time of the qubit. In quantum computing, uh, noise is also a very crucial uh, limitation. So short coherence time means no uh, high fidelity operations, no high fidelity gates. And what quantum computing field invented is actually a quantum error correction. Question is, can you actually uh, apply quantum computing protocols to improve sensors? Uh, and let me compare this dynamical decoupling with uh, quantum error correction, how they are different and what, is, uh, uh, what are the similarities. Uh, in dynamical decoupling, you try to control noise by applying pulses on your spin system. So you have now NV center, which is the subject of the noise. You apply so-called dynamical decoupling, this ECHOS technique and you apply many pi pulses, you refocus some of the perturbations and uh, you can do much better now in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms, in terms of the um, uh, sensitivity, but there are some limitations. If you try to fight external noise having a high frequency, you need to put pulses very, very close. And uh, pulses in reality do have some lens. Uh, and in general, uh, if pulses are coming so close that there is no space in between them, you can, in this uh, uh, protocol, cannot sense anymore. In other words, um, there are some limitations in protecting the system uh, against noise that having a higher frequency than your drive. In more general statement, uh, you can say that you can protect your quantum system against noise using these drives provided that your drive Rabi frequency is higher than the highest frequency in the noise. We can also apply not pulses, but just continuous fields. But this statement holds always, provided that your driving ability is so good that you can uh, drive your system faster than any the, the highest frequency component of the noise. So the high frequency noise is usually very hard to, uh, to fight. 
And uh, this is true for quantum sensing, and this is true for quantum computing. In quantum computing, there is a tool called quantum error correction. And so there were ideas how to uh, handle and how high frequency noise using quantum error correction. There are some uh, papers on this subject, first proposing this in a theory. And uh, I would like to show you one uh, example uh, of experiments where you, you can show that you can apply quantum error correction to handle uh, the noise that um, dynamical decoupling cannot handle. Right, uh, maybe uh, first a few words how quantum error correction works. Actually, it works based on redundancy. Instead of one qubit, you use several qubits. For example, for one error type, you use three qubits instead of one. And then if because of noise, you get one qubit flipped, uh, you can detect the unwanted flip by looking on a symmetry of the state. So you see that uh, uh, there is uh, basically two more spin up than spin down. And you, by detecting this without measuring it, you can correct it. Uh, by flipping your spin back without measuring, that's very important. You keep the phase alive and you correct your flipped spin back to the initial state. This is how quantum error correction works. It doesn't allow you uh, actually uh, in the protocol to measure the qubit, but indirectly uh, detect the error and correct it. Now the question is, can you apply this for sensing? So actually, a very good uh, quantum computer is not a good sensor because it's protected against all the noise sources. If you run this protocol for many qubits, uh, correcting all types of errors, you will not be able to detect any signal because you fully protect your system. Uh, but if your noise and if your signal are of different types, for example, if signal is a spin flip and the noise is a phase noise, then you can distinguish these two and you can correct spin flips and you can uh, measure phase or vice versa. You can correct phase noise and you can measure flips. Is it convincing? Right, okay. So, but really convincing is the experiment. So the uh, model system that we took uh, was the one that uh, um, you've been introduced yesterday. It's in uh, vCenter and another qubit, which is a C13 qubit, located quite close, about a nanometer. And uh, this C13 qubit, remember, it has very long uh, phase memory time, much longer than in vCenter. We call it clock qubit, but it's not sensitive. And so this uh, sensitive to external field qubit is in vCenter electron spin, and carbon-13 uh, nuclear spin is a uh, qubit with long memory time, but it's, uh, it's not good sensor. Uh, in a general quantum computing protocol, you would need a third qubit. But in case if one qubit is much better than the other, you can use two of them to uh, actually improve the bad qubit and still be able to sense. So it's very particular scenario that was developed for uh, for sensing here where qubits are not the same. So you have one qubit and vCenter, which is sensitive but bad in terms of coherence time, and another qubit which is not sensitive but very good in terms of uh, coherence time. And so we try now to merge this two. Um, so the protocol um, we have developed for this, it's not a very general error correction protocol, but it's now adapted to this situation. And I would like to guide you through this uh, protocol and show you how you can correct the, uh, the flip error uh, and still send the phase. So we start our uh, measurements with entangled state. So before we made a hard work to create entanglement between nuclear spin and electron spin using tools that we have discussed already. So we start with initial state to be uh, zero, which is a state of in vCenter electron spin and nuclear spin down and minus one and nuclear spin up. Now this superposition between zero and minus one start to acquire the phase during a free evolution. This phase is the one that you want to use to measure external field. 
but now so you at some point you get an error and the electron spin get flipped instead of a minus one you get to zero and so instead of minus one here you get to zero so the flip from this point if you would continue your measurement you will start to acquire the wrong phase and all the information you gained about the phase that's mean about the external field is now gone so you want to correct this error and still uh, keep coherence on NV center. Now, what you do, you apply a C0 gate between uh, electron spin and nuclear spin and disentangling these two. After applying a C0 gate to this state, you will start to uh, basically keep the uh, coherence on nuclear spin and NV center is in minus one state. Right? You follow it? So you, uh, you flip. Uh, your uh, your electron spin for nuclear spin up. That's what happened here. If you don't flip it for nuclear spin down, that's what you see not gate do. Remember, yesterday we had cases where you flipped the electron spin depending on nuclear spin state because it was shifting the frequency. That's exactly what we do here. Now, uh, after this, you shine the laser, and laser polarizes electron spin, so it basically converts minus one to zero in both cases. And now you apply another C0 gate, and the C0 gate now flip the uh, electron spin for, uh, for the state down. So that means you get your state back, which is initial state. Yeah. Ah, so if you shine uh, the uh, ah, yeah, so this is this is not working because you don't know when the error comes. So the, you, you have to be able to protect it against, you mean to shine the laser so so often that, uh, so you need to disentangle. When you shine the laser, you you, you basically kill the uh, the coherence. And here the coherence is still in the in the electron spin state. It will uh, it will kill the coherence. So here, the uh, electron spin state is now in, in a pure state. You don't know which one, it's zero or one, but uh, so here you can kill the, um, kind of reinitialize the uh, electron spin without touching coherence. So if you would do it here, you would just repolarize your electron spin and your measurement will be gone. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. It's uh, uh, one of the types of error, it's a spin flip. So it's flip minus, so it's basically spin flip, but uh, spin flip, flip zero to one or, or one to zero. So that's how it defined. So it's, uh, it's, it's, there are only two types. So you can decompose anything to two types of errors and one is a spin flip and the other is a phase. So sigma X and sigma Z. So this is basically what you, you will get here. Ah, okay, so this is another type, like a spontaneous decay kind of, right? Uh, we will discuss this later. It, even this can be decomposed, uh, so to, to this type of, of, uh, of errors that we discussed. So the other is more complex, but actually it's interesting, it can be decomposed into these types. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So if I shine the, the laser, it will reset to the um, middle of the right. This is correct. Uh, yeah, so th that's true. So I would basically uh, do this in this case, uh, but um, So it might actually work and in, indeed so, but uh, you know, um, just shining the laser even during this uh, shining, so it can be some perturbation. Um, so if I don't reset and I shine the laser, it do uh, decouple, but the only thing is, um, 
you know, during this reset, there will be a perturbation of, uh, of phase here. Um, yeah, so I kind of not hundred, so I'm not hundred percent sure. Maybe there are also some ways to avoid this, but I'm a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so after the synod, you're definitely disentangled. So you are basically, you, you, you only have coherence in nuclear spins. And so you have, uh, uh, you can you can freely operate for the electron spin. So here you are kind of still in entangled state. So I think that during the uh, during this uh, reset uh, you will you will affect. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is now just a, a theory of this, and uh, we can also look on experimental data. So this is first the uh, the data of artificial noise we applied, and we recorded kind of. Uh, Ramsey fringes on a system, uh, but not scanning a time, but scanning the amplitude of the external field. And it produces uh, the oscillation. Like in Ramsey, when you scan a time, uh, it was just easier to scan the field from external. And so you get a, a Ramsey kind of type of signal. And if you apply external noise, uh, this is a blue curve, there is no uh, there is no amplitude to measure, so you have no sensitivity because the coherence time is gone. Uh, if you apply error correction, actually this red curve is the one that you regain when you apply error correction. So you now can measure uh, the field in much better uh, compared to the case with external noise. Uh, you can run it twice actually, and so require uh, more gates. Uh, but uh, you now can correct more errors, acquire for longer time. And remember, the longer you acquire, the better is your sensitivity. That's why your Ramsey fringes are uh, getting sharper, kind of, and uh, because of this uh, uh, of, uh, sharper rising edge of fringes, you get higher sensitivity. So in, in ideal case, you could run it infinitely, and you can get very many, many Ramsey fringes here, and so you can get very high sensitivity, but of course, that would require that error correction itself don't produce any errors. And in our case, we were only able to run about three runs. And after this, error correction steps themselves were corrupting the state. And so uh, error correction um, to be fault tolerant, tolerant to the, um, to the errors producing by error correction itself is a hard task, require very high fidelity of the gates. But for a few runs, uh, we were able to see better signal than uh, conventional uh, techniques to measure uh, fields is producing. Right. And here the uh, sensitivity curve, this is often uh, shown as a performance of your magnetometer. Um, actually, for this artificial noise, we even didn't plot it anything without uh, error correction because it couldn't measure the signal. And so here we plot in the sensitivity curve, we plot the smallest measured field versus sensing time. Remember, in an ideal case, your scaling is uh, as a square root of measurement time. And so that should be kind of a, a linear um, uh, plot here and uh, we do perform as expected a bit lower than uh, case without error completely and without noise so we uh, we pay the price for insensitivity because we need to apply gates and gates cost time so not all the time we measure uh, but apart from this uh, we can get pretty close to this uh, ideal uh, sensitivity curve All right, so it's a very different way to correct errors. It's not dynamical decoupling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think we can uh, actually make short break, and we can continue after the break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they have.
people are warming up, I can ask something. Mm -hmm. So, um, a few slides before you uh, 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 said that, yeah, so uh, if you have multiple spins, then you have the problem with polarizability. That's some spins will up and down, for example. But then, uh, and then it's preferable to have single spin. But then if you have multiple spins, then uh, you have better signal or so can you can you compensate with yeah so if you have more spins uh, even in this uh, case of uh, uh, stochastic polarization you can still win a signal the square root of number of spins mm -hmm. yeah. so in absolute numbers mm -hmm. uh, you can you can win uh, but because the volume of this uh, larger number of spins start to be larger yeah. Uh, so effective distance to them uh, start to get smaller. So effectively, um, though there are some some compromise, but you you still win with a with a volume, but a square root of the number of uh, of molecules. Now there is a normal signal which is a thermal polarization, and this rise with a number of spins. Hmm. Uh, so you basically have one uh, factor that go in linearly with uh, with volume and the other is a square root and at one point this linear rise uh, overshoot the stochastic one okay yeah but for yeah. very small numbers the stochastic is larger than the thermal yeah and then uh, maybe so if you are in a super radiant state i mean i don't know if i understand it correctly but i would expect that then all spins are oriented in the same uh way mm -hmm. then maybe you you win uh because then you have a, a larger spin and then uh you don't have this polarizability uh problem right so if you would have a correlated uh, yeah. state yeah. you might uh win in some cases yeah. definitely yeah. but uh, so here we are talking about like different molecules that are moving around okay. yeah so usually a quantum correlation can be built up inside of the molecule mm but not uh, not basically in this uh, okay. dis disconnected molecular ensembles yeah but i, I agree with this yeah. okay thank you so maybe one more question if, yeah uh, attachment is important um, then um, if you just attach a molecule, usually if it don't rotate, um, you still have broad lines because there is a dipole-dipole interaction between spins. Um, and you would like uh, this interaction to be uh, basically cancelled. So you also would need either uh, drive this nuclear spin or leave the molecule still to rotate. Uh, only then I think you can reach high enough spectral resolution. Your sensor is uh, having a very good spectral resolution already, but the signal itself, so that's uh, it's a challenge at the moment. Um, molecule might a little bit shake because of thermal uh, Kind of temperature effects uh, so if it sits it's a little bit vibrates but uh, these vibrations are quite small they are on angstrom time scale except the conformational change of the last protein which is a functional which is often like to be detected so these are large conformational changes where protein gold goes from one state to another uh, that's something that of course larger but that's something that uh, one like to look for We can continue the discussion in the coffee break, maybe. And yeah, let's meet in half an hour. Exactly.